Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to webinar six in the series, Sex Ed Made Simple. This webinar series aims to support educators, school district administration, and staff learn about sexuality education, what it includes, what it is, why it's important, and how to teach it. Each webinar in the series will be hosted by myself, Sasha Grenier, with expert guest speakers. During the webinar, we will accept questions in the question or chat window and weave them throughout. So make sure to be thinking of questions as we present and we'll have time at the end as well. You will, re you will remain muted for this webinar. This webinar is also being recorded and will be available on the Oregon Educator Network Sex Ed site. Following the QR code on this slide will get you to, to that site or you can go to www.oregonednet.org slash group slash sex hyphen ed. Likewise, if this webinar gives you an interest in beginning further conversations with your colleagues across the state, please visit the discussion forum page on the Oregon Educators Network Sex Ed Discussion Forum. We can all continue the conversation there. So, today's presentation will focus on teaching culturally inclusive sex ed. We are very excited today to welcome LaShonda Frederick and Elizabeth San Pedro. LaShonda is a research analyst at the Oregon Health Authority. Since arriving at OHA in 2011, she has written numerous reports on health disparities across the state, positive youth development approaches, and an informational brief for best practices for clinicians. She has presented her research at conferences around the country. She has a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science from North Carolina State University and holds a Master's of Public Health degree from University of Hawaii at Manoa, where she focused her research in culturally informed health curricula. LaShonda resides, resides with her husband, Dominic, and Persian cat, Gabrielle, in Portland. In her free time, she enjoys spin, bar three, and reading books on finance or black history. Elizabeth here currently works as a program trainer for the My Future, My Choice program, a sexual health education curriculum designed for students in the sixth grade. Elizabeth graduated with a bachelor's degree in chemistry experience in tobacco prevention and teen pregnancy prevention. Her experience in public health has stemmed from her passion in working with Latino community, and her research has focused on community-based teen pregnancy prevention intervention among Latina youth in the U.S. Thank you both for joining us today. We're so excited to have you. So you know me, I am Sasha Grenier. I'm a sexuality education specialist at the Oregon Department of Education. My role here at ODE is to support school districts in implementing effective healthy relationships and sex ed and promoting health, health and safety among students across the state. So let's get started. First, a little recap. We know that sex ed is much more than sex, right? Um, if you were to ask me, I would say it's everything. It provides information to support young people to create and maintain healthy relationships, explore their own values and boundaries, understand their rights, understand their physical bodies, and seek health care when they need it. It's about building the social emotional skills that it takes to make healthy choices for ourselves and have respectful, fulfilling relationships with each other. That's why sex ed is a central piece of health education. These skills form the foundation for healthy, safe, and fulfilling lives. We know that it works. It has been shown to be effective in improving academic success of students, preventing dating violence and bullying. It's been shown to help young people develop healthier relationships, delay sexual initiation, reduce unintended pregnancies, as well as ST HIV and other STIs, and reduce sexual health disparities among lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and other young people. We know how critical it is for students to learn this content and have the opportunity to define themselves, learn how to assert their health needs, and develop healthy and empathetic relationships. However, we also know that often we leave some students behind, especially those historically underserved communities. Does everyone feel welcome in our classrooms? Are we engaging everyone in the learning? Does our language and instruction feel relevant to everyone in class? Do all students feel comfortable enough to ask questions and get help when they need it? 
We know that there are historically underserved students in our classes, such as students of color, LGB and trans students, students with differing abilities who often don't feel included in our classrooms. And this has a huge impact. Because of this, students face worse health and academic outcomes. So in sum, all students have the right to access sexuality education, regardless of cultural background, gender identity, or sexual orientation. This webinar will focus on approaches to supporting specifically our Black and Latinx students in our sex ed classrooms. So now let's hear it from our guest speakers, Elizabeth and LaShonda. First up, I'll pass the mic to LaShonda. Welcome. One second. So my name is LaShonda Frederick, and today I'm gonna to talk about culturally responsive sexual health education uh, for black youth. Stop letting me advance. Um, it's not letting me advance the slide. Okay, that's okay. I'll take the controls back and I will change slides when you okay. continue, okay? Okay, thanks. Ah. Okay, next slide. All right, so a little bit about where I sit. I sit in the Adolescent and School Health Unit with an Oregon Health Authority's Public Health Division. Um, our vision is that Oregon is the very best place for all youth to learn, grow, and thrive. And our mission is to support the health of all youth in Oregon through evidence-based and data-driven policies, practices, and programs. Next slide. Um, so a little bit about the Adolescent and School Health um, Unit. Um, within that unit, there are four programs. So we have the Adolescent Health Policy and Assessment Specialist. Um, this person is tasked primarily with tracking legislation that would impact um, adolescent health, um, as well as work with the Oregon Healthy Teen Survey, which some of you um, educators may be familiar with. Um, then we have school-based health centers, and I think at current, at Currently, we have 76 across the state. Um, we also have a school nursing consultant who um, provides technical assistance and um, in partnership with ODE to increase the presence of school nurses um, within schools. And then you have youth, the Youth Sexual Health Program, which is where I sit. I am funded by the Personal Responsibility Education Program, um, better known as PrEP. Um, we have served about 8,000 youth since 2011. Um, in nine counties across the state with um, comprehensive sexuality education. Next slide. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit. Let's switch gears. We're going to talk about um, some culturally responsive um, practices for your Black students. One of the things um, as but people, what we like to do, we like to look back because that informs where we're going. Um, so I want to share um, just kind of provide a framework and some context um, to sex, Black sexuality in um, the United States. So first and foremost, cultural origins of Black love and sexuality. So this was before the um, transatlantic slave trade interrupted that. So back in Africa, Black love and sexuality was reaffirming, um, resilient. It was between consenting adults. Um, partners were valued and complementary to each other. Um, sex was intended to be pleasurable for both partners um, with the hopes of bringing forth life. And also, it was a, a sacred act to build a strong foundation for the home and community. Next slide. Okay, but we all know, unfortunately, <clears throat> that that did not last. And so first, before we go any further, I, will, I want to take this um, time to provide a disclaimer. And um, some of the things that you're going to hear may have some things, you may feel some things bubble up. Um, this is not to ascribe guilt or blame, but this is to, this is the truth. Um, this, these are people's truths that I'm going to speak. I hope that you will lend me an empathetic ear and open mind because the legacy left from slavery is going to impact um, every black student that you teach because it, I'm going to talk about how it permeates every inch of black society. Um, 
the only culture that I can think of um, where our sexuality and our being has been used to weaponize us. So again, this is going to be uh, talking about race is hard um, and some things might be uncomfortable, but we will get through it and I hope you will leave informed and um, kind of with a, a different approach and view of your students of color, specific, specifically black students. Next slide. All right, so today we're going to talk about five sexual archetypes that emerged from slavery and the impact that they have today. Um, I recognize that there are, are several other ones, but the main ones that I'm going to talk about are the Mammy, the Uncle Tom, the Sambo, the Black Buck, and the Jezebel. And all of these archetypes have um, socio-political um, implications to this day. Um, I want you to um, pay attention to um, the role that age plays into these archetypes, as well as whether they are deemed a sexual threat to white people, whether they're deemed sexual competition for white people, and whether they are just um, a threat to white safety in general. Next slide. So the first one we're going to talk about is the mammy. I'm not sure how many of you have seen Gone with the Wind. But it's one of my favorite movies, but you remember the mammy. You remember she was this, you know, coarse, sassy woman who had these one-liners and she kept everyone in line. The mammy was an asexual yet maternal uh, woman. She was typically dark-skinned and obese and very loyal to her white family. And she was safe to have her own. She was not deemed um, sexual competition. Um, and she also had um, privileges and a little bit of power over keeping the plantation slaves in line. So she was in the house and so she would make sure that the, the field hands were kept, you know, in check. Um, from slavery throughout the present, the mammy serves the political, so, shows us social and economic interests of white America. There is some debate about just really how prevalent um, mammies were um, in slavery. The mammy archetype kind of rose out of um, reconstruction um, and so we're not sure just, you know, how pervasive and how many mammies there, there were. Obviously, there were some. Um, but after the end of slavery, that's when you saw Aunt Jemima. There were um, dolls, like little mammy dolls. I um, mean, it made some people very, very wealthy. Um, I think Mrs. Butters were. So you can probably think of some some kind of mammy, mammyisms. The mammy is still prevalent in film and literature today. So as you see, um, there's Tyler Perry. We um, also just think of as Medea. We have Martin Lawrence as, you know, Big Mama's house. So you have these black men who dress up as these older kind of obese, dominating um, black women. Next slide. All right, the next one you have is the Uncle Tom. So this is um, kind of the mammy's kind of part, not saying that they were married, but they were on that same side of the spectrum. They um, were older, they were no longer deemed um, competition or threat to white people and the system of white supremacy in general. Um, so the Uncle Tom um, was from Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin, and it was a loyal, um, it was an antebellum novel wrote about a decade before the outbreak of the American Civil War, and the loyal servant was whipped to death by his master for not betraying other slaves. Modern Uncle Tom is it's it's flipped, it's morphed into something different. It's a, a you know a black man who will happily and easily throw black people under the bus, you know, to protect white society. So kind of more from, you know, the self-sacrificing for his people to for to white people. Um, Uncle Tom was a God-fearing, self-sacrificing, loyal, trusted servant to the family. Um, he was submissive and docile and not aggressive towards whites. He um Again, look at notice the asexuality and the past the sexual crime. So that means he was um, sexually non-threatening to white women. And if you can see on the side the the pictures, they all kind of have that same um, look. You see Shirley Temple dancing. I'm not sure who this character is of. It's like a Mr. Bojangles or something. But <clears throat> you would never ever see, especially back in those days, and probably not now, a Sidney Portier in his sexual crime, or Harry Belafonte, or um, 
trying to think, or, or Sammy Davis Jr. dancing in their prime, dancing with a young um, girl, because that was just not something that would be seen because he would be seen as a threat. Um, yeah, so again, notice the asexuality and past the sexual crime. Yes, you may proceed. Now we're gonna head to the other side of the spectrum. And if you do not remember any archetype um, out of this, please remember the black buck. Um, the black buck um, attributes are black men are athletic and can work all day like animals, so they're not human. They have these super natural sense and they are basically animals and can reproduce and work just like them. They're hypersexual. They, they're meant to reproduce without attachment to offspring or partner. Um, while I've mentioned a lot about asexuality, the slave owner most definitely did not want asexual slaves. He needed slaves to breed so that they would produce more slaves and more revenue for him. But you have to remember, um, back in those days, the black man had no power to protect his family. He had no way to um, support that family. He had no way to protect his wife if she was um, being raped or his children if they were sold away. So there was this kind of detachment from the offspring or partner. Not saying all and not, you know, but there, there was this kind of removal because you could lose them at any time. Um, violent, strong, barbaric, and needs to be controlled for public safety. This archetype has been responsible for suppressing black progress, justifying violence, imprisonment, and lynching. Many policies that have been used to continually disenfranchise blacks. I'm not sure if, um, if I can, if you see me pointing. The third picture from the left is of a white man in blackface. So this came from D. W. Griffith's um, Birth of a Nation in 1915. And this was um, <clears throat> a white man in blackface who was hiding under like a bridge and this lily white woman come out and he was going to attack and rape her. So instead of, um, you know, being sullied and, you know, having the shame of being raped by a black man on her, she decides to commit suicide. That movie was basically a dog whistle, calls her arms that the black men needed to be controlled. It also gave rise to the um, the most powerful of the, the Ku Klux Klan eras, um, that, which lasted for 15 plus years. Um, the reach of the Ku Klux Klan due to this movie even reached up to the White House. So we have to realize um, just how bad they they made that black book um, stereotype. So next slide, please. Okay, so now we have the Sambo. So now the Sambo is also in his sexual prime, but he has seen he has seen what's happened to the black buck once he forgot his place. He could be punished with um, whippings, castration, um, losing his family. So the sample says, I, I got to go another way. So this is a, a typically a grown man um, who is docile, lazy, kind of irresponsible and has an infantile and childish behavior. And they have like a childish attachment to the plantation master. Um, because this was a survival mechanism because they saw they needed to suppress their black masculinity and manhood to disarm white fear. They saw what had befallen the bed bucket and they wanted no parts of that. So that's where a lot of um, the Sambo is one of the more pervasive um, archetypes that came out of slavery was just the bumbling, um, excuse me, the bumbling um, black person like, I, yes, my side, I was want some because you had to, you had to feign ignorant because it was a way to save yourself because if they knew that you could read, if they knew you had intelligence, um, you could be killed for that. Um, next slide. And the last one that we're going to come to is the Jezebel. <clears throat> it's a Jezebel. So this emerged from the slave trade and colonialism. Um, and this not only applies to Africa, it applies to places in Oceania or um, Australia, Latin America, in tropical areas and different cultures. They found the women to either be scantily clad, not wearing a lot of clothes. Um, and so they took this as sexually suggestive um, and the fact that they and used that for their own pleasure. Um, the Black Jezebel was the antithesis and arch enemy uh, to the white woman um, back, you know, in those days. The slave 
Master had access to any woman he wanted, and the white women were typically, the misses of the house were typically power, powerless to stop it. So you had um, <clears throat> white women who did not want any young, um, you know, black female around and preferred the mammy because they were not seen as sexual competition. Um, the Jezebel was seen as seductive, hypersexual, tempting, lewd, predatory. Um, and research has shown to this day that white girls are seen as more sexually mature than white girls of the same age. Um, the black Jezebel is also then um, used to um, imply that all black women won sexual relationships with white men um, and used to justify slavery, ownership, and rape. Um, there was a case back in the 1800s where a slave killed her master because he was raping her and she went to court and she was found guilty and she was hung. And that sent the message that black women cannot be raped. You are probably, and this extends to men too, because black men were raped. You cannot be um, raped because you, you, he owns you. You're just property. And I think about even I, I can't think of, maybe you all can, but I can't even think of in this modern day, a very, uh, a suit where a black woman has successfully sued or had a white man prosecuted for her rape. Those seeds were so, or they were kind of planted in slavery and it's still thriving today. Um, that different, that power differential. Um, currently the black Jezebel is portrayed heavily in music. You see it in music videos, you see it on social media, you see it on film. One of the things that I want to call attention to really quickly is the last one I said, I, I went, the last picture says, I went all the way with LBJ. That was an actual, and it has like a, you notice the vernacular, and it's a, like a very caricature, like a, a pig and any black woman who is pregnant. Well, see, back in, this was done right after the civil rights movement. There were black families and communities together, and of David and Goliath story working together to get that Civil Rights Act passed. They notice that they're like, okay, well, this collective activism, now we cannot have this. And so what comes in is the war on poverty in a great society. Black women are saying, hey, they're like, hey, we'll subsidize your lifestyle. We'll give you a free house. We'll give you free food. We'll, you know, give you a few pennies to take care of your children. But the, the catch is you can't have a man around. And, and some women fell for the okie dokie. You saw the manifestation of this that in the 80s when those youth started to come of age with um, the craft wars and things of that nature. Even today when I, I, I think about when they kind of remove the black man from the home and it leaves these societies vulnerable. I think of like if you watch a football game or a basketball game and it, it always have this heart felt um, like this was a, um, a son of a single mother who worked many jobs but this this white man, this white family kind of came in and recognized his talent and pushed him up and lifted him up. You see that kind of before the, you know, college games, I'll roll my eyes. But that was a way that white, um, the white government could continue to have some say in meddling in the black household. I know that was deep, but I mean, it is what it is. Next, um, next slide, please. So now we're going to talk very, very briefly of other influences on black sexuality. I have gone on about the racial and um, exclusion, uh, racism and exclusion um, religion. So Christianity, um, the message is premarital sex is a sin and, you know, there are anti-LGBTQ sentiments. Household composition, poverty neighborhood just talked about um, those factors that promote and kind of keep families in that cycle of poverty. Um, potential loss of autonomy during childhood, so childhood abuse, um, being exposed to trauma, you know, maybe from a parent who was not there or on drugs, um, historical traumas that have been passed down, um, mass incarceration due to laws that are aimed at um, specifically black men and dis disparate sentencing laws and the HIV epidemic, which still to this day um, disproportionately impacts the black community. Next slide. Um, here's just some for your reference. I'm not going to go through them. Some risk and protective factors for unintended pregnancy and STI infection impacted by racism um, and anti-blackness. I went through some of those and we just skipped that for your reference. Next slide. Next slide. Oh. Hi. 
Okay, there we go. There we go. Um, so I want to conclude and talk about what well, we are returning to our roots where Black love and sexuality is honored um, and that we are forming the strong foundation for our families and communities and passing that legacy down. And we understand what our past has been and it's been traumatic, but moving forward, how can we build um you know, and combat still this system of racism um, with our families because that's basically family and love. It, it's the base, it forms this base of um, our lives and our community. So while we're, we're still doing some work, but I am happy to report that we are, we are on our way. Next slide. All right, and I'm gonna turn it over to Elizabeth. Thank you all. Thank you so much, LaShonda. That was awesome. Elizabeth? Perfect. So thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. Um, I feel super honored to be able to talk about this topic. And I think in the same way that LaShonda has started with a little bit of a disclaimer, um, I also want to talk about a little bit of a, a disclaimer when we talk about uh, culturally inclusive classrooms, specifically uh, for Latino youth. And, and one in being that Latino, the Latino population is super diverse. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about this a little bit more, but um, the topics that we're going to go over in some of these slides um, are some of them are our main generalizations and, and commonalities, but it's not the one lived experience. It's not the only experience. And so I definitely want to uh, provide that as a little bit of a disclaimer that applies to to the situation. So, yeah, um, so a little bit of an overview. Um, Yes, so I am. Uh, I work currently for the Department of Human Services um, as a program trainer for the My Future, My Choice program. So a little plug for that. Um, we are a 10 lesson curriculum, half of which are peer led and half of which are led by a health educator um, or teacher in the classroom. So it's really, really exciting to see this work. Um, I'm incredibly passionate about it because you really see it play out in the classroom and how um, sex ed isn't just about sex ed. I think Sasha's touched upon that uh, pretty well. And so we'll just go ahead and dive into this topic. Um, and so before we begin, I wanted to cover some of the, the different areas that we're going to be talking about, and one of them being um, sort of comparing uh, differences between culture and diversity, um, exploring Latinos and, and sexuality, and also just general tips for how to create this in culturally cl inclusive classroom. Um, so before we get started, um, I'm a big definer person, so I like to define terms so that I can better understand them. Um, and so I, I looked at what uh, we define culture as being. And so um, a great definition that I found that I really, really loved um, was that it's not just the languages, customs, and beliefs, but it's also the knowledge and collective identities and memories that we develop by members of all social groups that make up their social environments meaningful. Um, and one of the important things about culture is that it's adaptive and transformative. So it's, it's ever-changing. It's, it's not just a, a, a one and done. Um, it's something that is uh, both pre pro uh, proactive and reactive to its surroundings, and, and one of those things that is keeping people united and feeling um, a sense of unity and togetherness. Next slide. Um, and when we look at diversity, diversity has a, sort of a, a similar um, kind of feel to it in that it, it's including race, it's including religion, it's including all of these other identities by which we uh, think of ourselves as. Um, and one of the most important, I think, is the lived experiences. So our life experiences are also a piece of who we are, a piece of this uh, diverse diversity in our thought process, uh, diversity in terms of our culture, and looking at how these things are impacting how we take uh, sex education. Next slide. Um, and so why is it important to talk about this? So cultural beliefs uh, shape our understanding of sexual health. Uh, what we're taught from a young age um, impacts us throughout. So whether it be gender roles, whether it be um, our relationships around um, healthy relationships, whether or not something is considered healthy or not, whether or not an appropriate age difference is really an appropriate age difference, depending on whether it's younger or older. Um, communication, who's doing the talking? Um, is it males that are doing the talking or is it females that are doing the talking? Um, what if you're not female or male? Who should be doing the talking? Um, uh, talking about LGBTQ uh, plus issues. I think I forgot the little plus there. Um, but our acceptance of ourself um, and our, our self-acceptance of our own sexuality and other sexuality um, and parental respect and norms and, and looking at what 
define sexual education. Um, cultural beliefs are one of those things that, that encompasses all of that. So we are, ever this, from the moment that we're born, we are learning what is acceptable. We're learning what appropriate behavior is, um, and it's all defined by our culture. Next slide. Um, and so when we look at Latinos and the Latino population here in Oregon, um, Latinos make up 12% of Oregon's population, which is approximately 496,000 people. Um, the median age for Latinos in Oregon is 24.3, meaning that Latinos in Oregon are young. Um, and it's also shown in our schools. So currently they make up 21% of all K through 12 students. Um, and while we have the assumption that Latinos are uh, mainly identify as Mexican, uh, we actually have a variety of different groups. And so whether it be individuals that are from Central America, so we're talking about Honduras or Nicaragua, um, South America, so now we're heading to Chile, Peru, um, our friends in Colombia, um, or Puerto Rican or, or Cubanos or um, Dominican. So whether it is that they identify um, as one of these other uh, nationalities, um, they still make up part of that population in Oregon. And so to talk a little bit about, okay, so now, now we've, we've defined a little bit of, of where this culture is coming from. Now to define a little bit more of the sexuality piece. And so we've, we've talked about how sexuality is not just about sex. However, in the Latino community, there's a strong sexual silence. Um, so generally it's not talked about. Um, there is a strong taboo. It's extremely taboo to even mention it, um, to start talking about it at a young age is just unheard of. And parental communication regarding sexuality is often lacking for some of the same, similar reasons. Um, and it's seen as something that is very dirty. It's, it's not something that you should be talking about. Um, a different type of person, a more promiscuous person talks about it. Maybe someone that works in a different industry talks about it, um, but not someone who is a, a good behavior or, or someone that is more acceptable in society. Um, there's a lot of research that has been shown that there's, it, there's, there's a strong um, gender difference in that uh, many Latino men often know more than Latino women in terms of uh, words to describe different sexual acts. Um, and Latino women, Latino women tend to be left a little bit more in the dark um, and given the message of don't open the legs and you'll be fine and that's it. Um, and so uh, those kind of messages are, are very, very strong in the Latino community. Um, and then before we move on, I wanted to sort of make a little bit of a, of a pause um, in talking about Latinx. Um, and so in terms of the term Latinx, um, if we're not talking about sex and we're not talking about our sexuality, then what's to say that we're going to start talking about our gender identity? Um, and so Latinx is, is one of those terms that is, I think, a little bit more of a um, newer term. Uh, for a lot of people, a lot of communities, there's, um, I tend to find a lot of individuals that aren't uh, super in the know about it, so I wanted to take the opportunity to make sure and explain it. Um, and so when we talk about Latinx, it's a gender neutral alternative to just saying Latino, Latina, um, or even Latino with the little at symbol. Um, and it includes people who are trans, queer, agender, non-binary, gender non-conforming, or gender fluid. So here we're talking about all genders. If you don't fit one or the other, this, this is a term that could be more inclusive. Um, and the reason that this uh, has sort of come up or, or sort of the, the background to this, to this term um, is that uh, the Spanish language is very gendered. So even objects have um, a gender. So when you refer to a table, it's la mesa, so la being female. When you refer to a car, it's referred to el coche or el carro. Um, so so in, in that sense, there's already a difference. Now, when we talk about people, we talk about a group of doctors and say they're all female doctors, we say las doctoras. As soon as one male joins that group, it becomes los doctores. Um, to be more respectful of the male that just joined that group, even though there's more females in the group than there are males. But anyway, um, so it's more of an inclusive term. And so it's, it's one that has been um, coming up pretty frequently. And I think for a lot of individuals, it's, it's been, um, there's been a little bit of controversy actually, actually for, for some people because um, the, the Spanish language is so, um, it, it's part of your culture. It's, it's part of, you know, your, your flavor and part of your, your um, 
knowing that you're a Latina or a Latino. Um, and part of the argument is that actually this is something that is more uniting and it's not trying to be exclusive, it's more inclusive. Um, and so for those individuals that don't fit, but still love the fact that they are Latina, they have their strong culture, this is for them. Um, that's, again, that's not to say that this is like, oh, if I don't fit, then I have to use that. Not at all. Um, but it's a term that's, I think, um, coming out and uh, it's, it's also super exciting to hear. Um, and so coming back to, to, to where our sexuality is impacted and, and how it's impacted, um, there's a lot of different factors that can impact how we learn, or rather what is learned and the lack of. And some of those stem from um, general embarrassment or shame, um, as uh, also uh, language barriers and a fear of el que dirán, and, and saying that the Latino Latinx community is very strong in numbers, in collaboration, in unity, and in culture, in food, in language. Um, you, if you identify as being Latino, oftentimes, again, not to say that every, this is everyone's experience, but if you find someone else that shares your culture, shares your language, you get excited because you have a shared experience and you've probably gone through similar things and you feel that connection. Um, and in that same way, because there's probably that embarrassment and shame as well in talking about anything that has to do with sex and sexuality, there's also a little bit of that fear like, well, if I ask something, what are other people going to think? I know that this is one thing that when I was younger and growing up and, and having the one talk. I think that I had in my entire adult adolescence um, period, adolescent period, uh, I think was that, well, you know, what, what is your aunt going to say if, if she finds that you, you're talking about that? Or what is this person going to say? Or, or, or don't say that because what are people going to think about you? Um, and so I think that there's that strong um, sense of, of, of fear of really what are other people going to say about my daughter talking about or asking these types of questions and knowing these things. Um, in terms of a relation for promiscuity. Um, and then, of course, you have racism. I mean, you have income status and immigration status, which are other things that um, are highly impacting uh, your knowledge and access um, to learning about different sexual health topics. Um, and your marital status. I think there's a lot of studies that have, have uh, shared that Depending on your marital status, there again comes back to that fear and shame that you may be embarrassed to ask certain questions of your physician or your doctor or your, or your nurse if you're not married. Why, if you're not married, you should not be having sex. Um, so if you are asking these questions and you're not married, then why, what are you doing? Um, and then uh, there's the <clears throat> piece of acculturation. So how much have we been exposed uh, to the culture in which we are living in terms of our dominant culture, so the white culture, um, and then talking about religion. So again, there's, there's that um, need that, there, that you need to uh, wait until marriage in order to be uh, sexually active. And then of course, the gender role in, inequity. So um, knowing that there's differing, differing expectations between um, those that identify as male and those that identify as female. Mm. Um, however, if we look among parents and adults, um, it's interesting because a lot of research has, has shown that um, Latino and Latinx and Latina parents are the ones that are probably one of the most supportive of their students gaining this information because they themselves do not have the same, the right information or the correct information. Um, and there's a, a, a difference in language. There's a difference um, in that culture being second generation or third generation. Um, and they have their own embarrassment or fear. So a lot, like I mentioned, um, a lot of these behaviors have been strongly associated with uh, le different levels of, of, of promiscuity. And so that's directly going against religious and conservative family values. Um, a lot of parents never had a role model. Uh, it's, it's been shown that um, sexual talk, especially in, in, the, in a romantic relationship, is super disrespectful. Um, so if they themselves didn't experience this and didn't really learn any of these topics until they were married and probably having kids, um, there's not really that notion that maybe their children should know. Um, so they, they even believe that maybe their children should be uh, much older before talking about these topics. Um, and that also in the, the countries that our parents originated from, 
uh, there's the uh, chance that talk about sex and sexuality is, is limited. Um, and this can uh, especially vary, I think, when we think about the different countries of origin. Um, and then also, you know, where our parents are go growing from. Are they, you know, from the city? Maybe there's more exposure to different programs. There's different exposure to different um, schools and education. Are they from, you know, itty bitty rural town outside another, you know, major city? And so those are all factors that are influencing this. And so now that I've provided a little bit of that cultural context, um, to talk about a little bit more about what works. Um, again, the Latino community, Latinx community is a strong believer in family. Um, family unites. And um, as, as this is one of those things that is a, a strong unifying piece, uh, Latinos, Latinas, and Latinx traditionally turn to their families and communities for help and advice. So when you hear of, a, of an individual that has a bad experience going to XYZ clinic, um, chances are that, though, that that individual friend's going are pretty slim to none. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a big network that shares our information. So information is greatly shared, especially if something is going good, that is shared, especially if something's going bad, that's also shared. Um, but parental influence has been cited as one of those huge reasons and primary reasons for um, youth avoiding teen pregnancy. And so parents are actually one of the most influential. And a lot of research has shown that actually moms tend to be even a little bit more um, influential than their parents, than, than father figures. Um, and so in terms of those types of households, um, moms are, are often seen as sort of the best bet. Um, also, understanding our cultural values and significance without judgment or fear. I think youth are really um, in tune with realizing whether or not there's judgment, especially um, and maybe in understanding machismo. And if someone has accepted that, it's like this is this is the, how it is, and and you know there's not really necessarily anything maybe wrong or bad or or this is how it's been accepted for me to not not characterize that with with judgment. Um, and not look at it as something like, oh shoot, like this is not how this should be. Um, and understanding that identity and culture are, are highly intertwined um, and that there are various forms of identity. You know, someone might, we just, you know, introduced a term of, of Latinx. Um, however, again, someone may, may be more comfortable saying, I'm a Latina, uh, I'm Chicana, I'm a, a Black Mexican, I'm a, a, a Boricua. Um, what, whatever it may be, but becoming more uh, familiar with these different terms and understanding um, the historical reference and understanding the cultural references. Um, and then, of course, just fostering relatability, connectivity, and commonality. So again, um, because these experiences are common, it doesn't mean that they're unique, um, but they are common. And so often these are experiences that um, can be shared and can, again, bring students together and unite students in the learning process and not make them feel ashamed of, of saying, well, you know, I know a lot less than my white peers about condoms or about contraceptives or about sex in general, so I don't have to feel bad about that because chances are my fellow peers are that way too. Um, so making sure that we're understanding that difference and making sure that we are in tune with that. Um, so some just key pieces or, or spots and where you can start um, just universal teaching tools. Number one, definitely examining your assumptions. So also not assuming that um, because you know someone's history or, or life experience that now you know their identity. And we always definitely want to ask, you know, what do you prefer? Um, I think there's a, a notion that because someone looks um, has dark skin, has black hair, brown eyes, that they speak Spanish. Um, and it may not be that case because of historical trauma, because of racism, um, that their parents decided not to teach their child Spanish because they thought that it would provide better outcomes and better opportunities. Um, so being in tune with your assumptions um, and making sure that we're um, really reflecting upon what we're actually seeing and not adding more value to what we're seeing. Um, Modeling inclusive language and behavior, I think, is one of those that is kind of really easy to start to do, um, making sure that we're knowing how to pronounce unfamiliar names. Um, I was just saying off the air with Sasha um, that I was so glad she said my name was San Pedro because there's countless, countless times where, where people are like San Pedro, um, and it's, it's kind of like that uh, little awkward moment in, inside of me that goes, oh, that's right, you're a little bit different, but that's okay, that's cool. Um, 
you love yourself. So that's that's what matters. Um, and definitely, um, I think when whenever uh, talking about idioms and, and whatnot, making sure that we're explaining them for for the purposes of of uh, those that are maybe maybe non-native English speakers. Um, and also, this I've noticed can be a generational thing and not just like an English language thing. Um, also, using multiple diverse and uh, diverse examples. So making sure that we're talking about all gender identities. So um, maybe Latinx is the term that your students want to use. Then use it. Um, you know, taking their, taking what they want to do and, and leading with that. Um, also establishing ground rules for interaction and, and having your students create those is, is a huge uh, motivator and push for them to realize that this is their classroom, this is their learning environment, and it can be conductive to their learning. Um, of course, being mindful of low ability cues, so avoid the, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be happy to help you with this. I know girls have trouble with math. Um, realizing that we're already setting a low bar and an association with females and math. And so making sure that we're avoiding things like those. Um, and then number six, um, definitely not asking students to speak for their entire group. Um, next slide. Um, we know that minority students often feel, uh, often report feeling invisible um, or so sticking out like a sore thumb. So we definitely want to um, acknowledge this and making sure that, that we're not having these experiences heightened. Um, because of when they are and they're asked to be, you know, Maria or Elizabeth, you know, what do you think um, as far as, you know, in your culture, what, what, what does that happen? And making sure that we're avoiding, I'm sure it goes without saying, but I'm making sure that we're avoiding those kind of situations because they can have an implications on uh, student performance. Um, definitely using diverse experiences and perspectives as a resource, but also not expecting your students to be your resource and to be responsible for your own learning. Um, and planning opportunities for all students to contribute input related to their own culture. And again, avoiding making any student a cultural representative. Now I'll turn it back over to Sasha to talk about, um, how, or sorry, um, LaShonda, <laughs> to talk about creating an inclusive space optimal for learning as far as the educator. All right. <clears throat> so thank you for that, um, Elizabeth. So some tips for creating an inclusive space optimal for learning. So as an educator, it's important to reflect on your own personal values and biases. Um, educate yourself and others on the legacy of slavery, Black and Latinx history, and sexuality and how it impacts you today. Um, take time to understand various identity terms specific to the community and you work with and live in such as Exicana. Now I'm gonna butcher that one. What is it? I say Chicana, Black, Black Mexican, Borica, etc. <laughs> but you get my old country accent. I'm like, what is that? Um, work in partnership with parents, families, and communities. And like Elizabeth said, one of the um the biggest things that you can do for Black youth as well is work with their families, work with their communities, work with their churches, because that's where um, a, they get a lot of their information from, and a lot of that um, information shapes their lives as well. So create a positive, equitable environment for all students. Uh, one of the things that I don't know if others can, is I can pick up on even subtle differences if I've been treated just a little bit different. Um, again, it's just that that survival mechanism. And a lot of students um, of color or who are um, maybe not in the dominant society can feel that. So tr have that warm, um, positive, equitable vibe for all the students because they can tell. Um, and once you do, then your integrity and your clout with them is raised. Um, so get support from others if you have questions. Again, it, it's fine. You're, I'm, you're not expected to know everything. You're not expected to agree with everything. Um, but if you have questions, um, ask others or go to the internet and consult Mr. Google. Um, allow yourself grace and room to grow. It's okay to be uncomfortable. That's one of the things, especially when we're talking about race, people don't want to approach the situation because they feel that they're going to say the wrong thing. Again, people can tell genuinely if, what your intent is. And if you're trying and, you know, you slip up and you're graceful about it, a person of color is not going to have you, you know, not, that might not work 
you know, so it, it's all learned. If we want to really um, transcend racism, we're going to have to get our hands dirty. And there are going to be some things um, he said. And so we're just learning from each other and, and growing together. So it's OK. Next slide. Yeah. All right. Some key things all youth need to know during sexual health education. So these are just <clears throat> the key takeaway, no matter sex, gender, identity, race, um, whatever. These are things that our youth need to um, thrive once they, they leave our classroom. So they need to know how to negotiate abstinence or safe sex with partners, um, how to identify healthy relationship traits and where to get help or resources when needed. Ways to resist pressure to have sex from peers, media, and partners. There's a lot of hypersexuality being portrayed in music and, um, you know, media. So how to resist that, how to kind of carve their own lane. Um, they need to know the various types of contraceptives, how to use them, where to get them, how much they cost, um, how long are they used for. Um, they need to increase their self-efficacy and positive youth development opportunities. So what um, opportunities are in your school or community that youth can volunteer um, to have some enrichment on top of their academic studies? Is there adequate um, access to sports or volunteer opportunities or, you know, trades, things like that, something to keep their mind occupied and how to communicate with the parents. That is key. Um, and so there's this myth that, oh, kids don't listen to their parents. And that is so not true, as Elizabeth said. Parents are more influential than our friends or the media, especially in early adolescence. Parental opinions on healthy relationships, abstinence, and contraceptives matter. So definitely start with the family because they are the first teacher um, when it comes to sexual health education. Next slide. Oh, and that is it for me. <laughs> Thank you both so <clears throat> much. Sorry, I'm getting over a cold here, <clears throat> so I sound a little strange. Um, but yeah, that was fantastic. I would love to open it up now to the audience for some questions. Um, so start typing those into the question box or into the chat window, um, and we will check that and answer anything you have for us. Um, I also wanted to say that these additional resources that are provided by our wonderful presenters will be available on the Oregon EdNet site. Um, in fact, the entire presentation will be available there, and you can always um, reference back to these resources whenever you like. So let's see, what sorts of questions do you all have? Uh, nothing yet. <laughs> so I was wondering, Elizabeth, I had a question on um, one of the things that you were talking about. Um, where some Latino youth and, or Latino parents, as you were describing, may not have gotten that information on their own when they were younger or even through adulthood. Does that, and, and you implied that that made them often more hesitant to talk about topics. Does it ever find, do you ever find it being the opposite? Like then they're like, no, 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 I didn't get this, so you need this. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I think that um, oftentimes they are very hesitant for them themselves to talk about those topics, but they want someone else to come in and talk to the okay. students because they realize, I, they realize themselves, I don't have the capacity to even talk about these topics or I don't have the capacity to even um, define these things correctly, uh, but my student needs to know them yeah. because I know I struggled. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's also interesting to think that um, you know, a lot of the students in our classrooms have just different background information, like they're coming from a very different position and, and to kind of gauge that ahead of time so we know how to approach learning for sure. All right, any questions for our presenters? Oh, here, we got one. All right, there is a lot of emphasis on including the parents. Can you talk about navigating language barriers? Mm -hmm. I think the biggest uh, piece of advice there is if you can find, I remember when my um, little sister was at a, a middle school. And so for my parents, it was one of those things I was off to college. And so it fell to my, to my next in line. So my little sister. And so um, at the school, they had a very impressive um, uh, uh, board of staff. So their staff members. Um, found other other Latino parents that were also in the school, but that worked there. 
Um, and so whether it's a band teacher, whether I think at, at this school it happened to be uh, one of the school counselors happened to be bilingual and happened um, to be from actually the same region, uh, I think that my parents ended up being, it was a perfect match where they involved this counselor and said, hey, we have the situation, we'd like to get the student into this, these courses, but we need to talk with the parents about this X, Y, Z. Um, and involving that staff member, just because that staff member is not um, a teacher, just because they're not um, some other uh, capacity doesn't mean that they can't be involved. And then, of course, there's the, the issue of compensation. I think, I think definitely using your resources wisely um, and then making sure that we are uh, looking into what resources we have. Because I think in schools, we should have some sort of, um, whether it be translator or some, someone available to address um, those language barriers. And I just wanted to remind folks too that our um, presentation that we did in October, I believe, our webinar from October, focused on parent engagement, parent and community engagement. Um, so for more conversations about really how to most effectively engage with our communities, parents and guardians and others, um, refer back to that webinar because it has some great tips on, on kind of how to navigate the diversity of communities that our, our students come from. Um, and what that could require, whether you know, thinking about things like transportation, translation, childcare, um, and really how to hone in on on how to how to welcome communities that often don't feel welcome in the school setting. So definitely check that out. Okay, let's check in for some questions. None yet. We'll just hold on for a couple more minutes. Um, and on the slides here, I'm going through some more resources that our presenters pulled together um, and their contact information here on this last slide. And then the final slide, again, is our QR code for our sex ed site, the, web, the website that we have put together. Um, and a reminder to join us for next month's webinar. It'll be Friday at the same time, 3 to 4, on March 29th. And the topic will be sexual health promotion as violence prevention. Um, so really another very important topic for folks to tune in for. Um, so if there are no further questions, I guess we're going to tune out now. Um, thank you all so much for spending your, your Friday afternoon with us. And feel free to contact one of us if you have any questions. And of course, visit our website where you can continue the conversation with your peers. All right, have a wonderful Thank week. you. Bye-bye. Well, Rhonda, thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you. Yes, yeah. bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs>